a mob supporting President Trump stormed the U.S. Capitol, breaking windows. One year ago tomorrow, the anniversary that possibly changed the trajectory of America forever. The anniversary of an event that divided our nation even further than we ever thought possible. The deadly siege on Congress. That exposed leftist hypocrisy like never before. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. And that opened the floodgates of an all-out anti-conservative movement to paint all of us as radicals. They allow that to happen. The Republican Party is basically a domestic terrorist cell at this point. This day will be all over the mainstream media today, tomorrow, for the next week. But I don't think it'll be on the minds of ordinary Americans, of moms, dads, teachers, nurses, white, blue, purple, or brown colored workers throughout our country. Because on the minds of those Americans is inflation, gas prices, it's Russia, Putin and war, supply chain shortages, empty shelves, big tech censorship, and China's growing control over the world. Real issues for real Americans that are facing us all. Americans are asking, how do we move forward? So tonight, I sit down with a man who's dealt with all of it before, and with more success than many realized at the time. This man may have the answer America needs. Tonight, President Trump on the economy. When I left, it was $1.87 a gallon for gasoline. Now it, in California, was just announced $7.77. On China and COVID. The mandates have been a disaster. And on the optimism we're all craving like never before. Can we turn this around and get on track. Quickly, Quickly. we can. Tonight, the January 6th distraction. President Trump on overcoming America's real challenges. Hello, America. I'm at home tonight. I have just gotten the exciting news that I have COVID. But tonight's uh, episode is extraordinarily important for a couple of reasons. Everybody in the mainstream media wants to focus this week on the one year anniversary of January 6th, which is tomorrow. The main reason for this focus is the left's unprecedented obsession with the man joining me tonight, former President Donald Trump. Revisiting January 6th gives the left an excuse, as if they really needed one, to revisit their Trump obsession and all of the scaremongering that goes with it. It's a chance for them to separate us from the rest of the country even more. The Mueller report didn't destroy Donald Trump as they hoped it would. Neither did all of the impeachments that they tried. So now they've pinned all of their Trump supervillain hopes on January 6th. Another reason for the media's focus on January 6th is it allows the other hand to not be seen. It gives them the opportunity to demonize you part of the left's never-ending bid for power and control, which is the whole point of the century-old project that they call progressivism. But the other thing is, the mainstream media will not say that two things can be true about January 6th at the same time. First one is that even the, the, the Capitol building incursion, it was wrong, and even Donald Trump knows that that was wrong. It was inexcusable. It was dumb on many levels. Put us behind the eight ball. It was stupid. And before anybody gets upset for me saying that, just imagine how we would have felt if it had been Antifa or BLM smashing the windows in the U.S. Capitol. I personally would have felt the same way. January 6th was not helpful to the constitutional cause. And at the same time, it is true that the January 6th committee is a complete and total sham. It's not a serious effort because it was never truly bipartisan, especially after the first impeachment clown show run by Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff. It's clear there's nothing, nothing that is truth seeking or cooperative about this effort. It's a witch hunt and they will burn their witch. Ultimately, this obsession with January 6th and Donald Trump is a massive distraction from the fact that America has had a disastrous 2021 under a democratically controlled White House and Congress, and everyone, no matter who you voted for, is hurting. 
The average American has moved on from January 6 because they had to. We're way too busy with our jobs, our family, food prices, debt, and how to keep enough gas in the car to get through the week. Things that have been made more difficult by inflation and the never-ending pandemic policies. Democrats don't want to talk about the real issues because America is reeling from the left's incompetent solutions. I want to focus on the future and practical solutions. I think that's where America is, and that was my mindset when I visited Mar-a-Lago recently for a sit-down interview with the former and potentially future President Donald Trump. Mr. President, thank you thank for you. Um, granting us this interview. Um, I asked the audience what they wanted me to talk to you about, and overwhelming was, please just first thank him for everything that he's done. And I, let me, I, I, one of them said this, but it was the reflection of all of them. Please tell the president, we have not forgotten what he did for us and what he sacrificed for us. Um, we really need to hear now, can we get out of this mess? Um, there's the deep state, the GOP, school choice, China and Taiwan, Russia and uh, Ukraine, the gas prices, the FBI targeting uh, parents. I'd like, to, I'd like to start with you on the economy and, and talk to me about how we can turn it around and what does permanent damage. So on the economy, is this just the natural consequence of shutting the world down for a pandemic? Or is this the policies that have been coming out? So inflation's a big word, and stagflation's uh, even worse, if you think of it. And we have lots of both. And a lot of that's caused, in my opinion, by energy. They shut our energy off. They got rid of Anwar. Can you believe that? Yeah. After many, many decades, Ronald Reagan tried to do it. He couldn't. We got it done. And Lisa Murkowski, who's a disaster senator out there, approved somebody. Her vote was the final vote whose first order was to close up Anwar. That's the biggest drilling site, maybe bigger than Saudi Arabia in Alaska. And so many other things. But, you know, it all begins with energy because it just, the trucks, the cars, the- Everything. The bakeries, the ovens, the stoves, everything, the planes, everything. It's such a big number. And when I left, it was $1.87 a gallon for gasoline. Now it, in California, was just announced $7.77. And the rest is all following. And they're not, they're, what they're doing now is because they believe that we have to be petroleum free. Which is just crazy. Insane. Yeah. We are not ready, even in 10 years. Can't we, is there a way to focus and, and um, uh, get the entrepreneurs to work on the things for the future while still pumping petroleum so you have both. We're reaching for the future, but we're not killing ourselves at the same time. So one thing is the other technology does not have the power to fire up our plants. It just doesn't have the power. Right. Wind is extremely expensive. By the way, the turbines are all made in Germany and they're all made in China, mm -hmm. those two places. And assuming you're believing in atmospheric filth, mm -hmm. which is what they talk about, when they make those turbines, no matter how much they save, if they save anything, the air is very dirty, assuming right. you believe that. But turbines, very expensive, doesn't work, and it's very intermittent, and it doesn't have the power to do what you want right. to do. And by the way, kills all your birds and ruins your, I mean, these magnificent landscapes that are right. just being decimated right. by wind. Solar doesn't have the power, and by that the way- It's dirty to make. It's very tough to make, and it's dirty. And by the way, you have to change them. You have to change those mm -hmm. panels at the end of 10 years. Everyone says, oh great, we just, no. As soon as you start getting your money back, which actually takes 30 years. Yeah, you don't. But in 10 years, you have to change the panels. Same thing on the wind. You take a look at those windmills after 10 years, they're beat to hell. And we have sitting, we're sitting on top of liquid gold, and the world doesn't want us to use it. And certainly China doesn't want it. We have something China doesn't have, and they don't want us to use it, but it's real power. And if you look at China, they're opening up a massive coal plant every week, every week. or more. Yeah. And it's not like, gee, it's gonna stay within the confines. That stuff comes up and it blows over to the United right. States. So we clean it up 
and it costs us a fortune. We can no longer compete with them. That's why I ended the so-called Paris Climate Accord, because it was so one-sided. I know you like that. Oh, yeah. It was so I like that you canceled it, yes. Well, we were going to spend a trillion dollars over a short period of time, and it was all against us. And, and you know also that it, it the Paris Climate Accords, I never understood why they were so passionate about it. It's because that was the beginning of the banking control. Correct. Right, where they are now saying, well, I don't know if you're a brown company, we may not be able to give you a loan. This is all happening and it's a fundamental transformation at a scale I don't think people yeah. understand. Yeah. It can, when Obama was stopped deep sea drilling right. and pulled all of the, the, the um, uh, drilling out, right. the concern was you don't just make a new one, those are on 20 year, 30 right. year leases. Absolutely. Are we going to be in three years in trouble if our banks are putting the small gas oil fracking coal people out and fundamentally changing the structure for green energy? Yeah. Can we recover from that no, quickly? No, because the green energy is not strong enough to fire up those plants and to I'm do saying all of though, this. Let, I'm saying though, let's just pretend <laughs> that you're going to be president okay. in, in three years. Can we turn this around and get on track? Quickly. Quickly. We can. Yeah, we can. I mean, we have to have optimism, and this is more than optimism. This is fact. We were energy independent 11 months ago. Totally energy independent. <laughs> And now we're going to OPEC to beg them for oil. I know. We're going to OPEC, Saudi Arabia, Russia. We're going to Russia. We're making Russia so rich. You know, when I ended the pipeline in Russia, everyone said, oh, I'm so nice to Russia. I got along great with Putin and with President Xi and with all of them. But there was never anybody tough like I was mm -hmm. on that. And with the tariffs on China, we took in billions and billions of dollars and frankly brought a lot of businesses back home because it no longer made sense for them to do things in China. But when they did the pipeline, and look at Russia, their primary thing is oil mm -hmm. and the cost. What we're doing is we're making them rich. Mm -hmm. When you see the kind of money that people are paying to OPEC, which includes Russia and Saudi Arabia, these people have never made this kind of money. This all happened over mm -hmm. a short period of time. We would become energy independent quickly. Again. Energy will, again, yeah. we were the, for the first time I, ever. I, I have to tell you, when I first heard that, I didn't think that was going to happen in my lifetime. Yeah. We have talked about that forever. No one in the press talked about the fact that we were energy independent. I remember the first time I heard that we were energy independent. Right. I heard it from you. Right. It's astounding. And in a month, yeah. we're back on. Well, they just turned everything off. Right. I got it going. So. We were bigger than Russia, bigger than Saudi Arabia. In one year, we would have been bigger than both combined. Think of that. We were making a fortune, and it was great for jobs, great for everything, and it was also great for people that drive a car. Right. Because they never had it so good. And right. now, all of a sudden, he just stopped the supply. I mean, you look at what they did. They stopped it. They closed down rigs. Uh, they stopped the leasing of government yeah. lands. Do you think there's any, any way possible that these things that are happening are just miscalculations. This seems so well planned out to destroy us. It's so many things. So many. And it's all self-inflicted. Right. And then you start to say, it must be on purpose. Millions of people allowed to come into our country. Prisons being emptied from many countries. You know, it used to yeah. be three or four, I'd say, but it's yeah. hundred, they had 121 countries now prisons being where people are being dumped into our country we have 12 i think it's i think it's 12 that came out 12 cities that are at their peak breaking, yeah, right. breaking records for homicides yeah. all run by democrats breaking points and many of those people that are causing the crime are coming through our southern border we had the strongest border in history mm. now we have the weakest border in history and that includes drugs we brought drugs down 61% and it was going to get better. Wow. And now, I hear it's five, six times more than it was at its worst. It's just coming through unimpeded. The, one of the first things that Joe Biden did was to stop the Keystone 
uh, pipeline, yeah. and then say to Russia, you can build your yeah. pipeline. Yeah. That's something that Reagan, forever we've been saying, don't do that. Yeah. Poland begged him, Ukraine begged him, don't do that. You had- I stopped it. You had stopped it. It was done. Correct. If, if you would have done that, people would have said, see, uh, there, he's in he's bed. He's friends with Putin. Friends he with loves Putin. Putin. You know, it's like crazy. I watched, this is being taped in, uh, what is it, November or December, um, and it would be airing in January. But I think it was this week, I watched Putin look at Joe Biden. I didn't see respect or fear uh, from him, a fear of the United States or respect for the United States. True. Um, it, it, do, you know Putin, you know how he thinks, you know how to deal with him. Is he going to move into Ukraine, do you think? Well, it's looking like that. Uh, you know, when Biden told him about what well, he was talking about sanctions, when uh, Biden says sanctions, Putin's saying, sanctions, if they're only going to sanction, then there's no sanction that's going to stop me from taking over a country. And by the way, it's a massive piece of land right. in an unbelievable location. Right. You know that. But he didn't say there could be very serious consequence. A sanction is not a serious consequence, no matter how strong it is. Not when it comes to taking over a country. Correct. And there was no fear. Look, with China, there wasn't, there, you didn't have planes flying over no. Taiwan. And I told President Xi, can't do that. You can't do that. We had a lot of great conversations right here at Mar-a-Lago mm -hmm. when he was here. We talked for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. We got to know each other very well. I said, you can't do Taiwan. And now all of a sudden, as soon as I leave, they start flying over many bombers. Tell me, the, oh. tell me, the, tell me what happens to us. I mean, they always accused you of trying to dismantle NATO. Yeah. NATO is falling apart and will mean nothing if we don't help Ukraine. And neither will any of our, our treaties if they move into Taiwan and we do nothing. What does the world look like with Russia in Ukraine and China in Taiwan? Well, if that happens, but with NATO is very interesting. I had my first meeting, 28 countries, including us, and I looked at the charts and I said, wait a minute, these people aren't paying. <laughs> They're delinquent, okay? You know the word, a real estate term. They're <laughs> delinquent. They're not paying. And I said at the first meeting, you're not paying. And then I had a second meeting a number of months later. I said, you have to pay. And somebody said, does that mean you won't protect us from Russia if we don't pay? I said, that's right, you have to pay. And you know what happened? $400 billion came in, $400 billion. I said, why would we protect you if it, we're not here to, to protect Europe. And by the way, you take advantage of us on trade. That was the other thing I was doing. They're almost as bad as China on trade, and nobody understands it, nobody knows it. What they've done with, with so many different companies, as an example, we can sell basically almost no farm product in. And I said, I said to Angela Merkel, how many Chevrolets do you have in the middle of Berlin? Mm. She said, why none? I said, that's right. And we have millions of Mercedes-Benz and all of BMW, all of these car companies are floating it in. I said, all of that's changing. Then we got hit with COVID, then I rebuilt it again. We rebuilt it a second time. I really hate to be the bearer of bad news, but your home might not be as safe as you imagine. When you think of danger, you probably think of somebody breaking into your house while you're gone, or worse yet, in the middle of the night. But what if they didn't have to break in? What if there was a way for criminals to literally take your house, your property, everything from you? Believe it or not, it happens all the time these days. It's called title fraud. FBI says it's the fastest growing crime in the nation. That's why you need home title lock, because you and I have enough to worry about. We can't do this, and it might be a year. Somebody takes it, cashes in on it, and the bank and the sheriff show up at your house uh, a year later, and then you're up a creek without a paddle. You've got to have home title lock. They'll put a barrier around your home's title. If they detect something from a cyber thief, thief to a renter to a relative trying to forge their way onto your home's title, they'll help shut it down. If you value your home and your peace of mind, best thing you can do is get Home Title Lock. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. 
HomeTitleLock.com. Enter your address, register it, and see if you're already a victim. Enter the promo code RADIO for 30 days of free protection. Code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. The vaccines came in in nine months instead of 10 or 12 years. They thought it was going to take anywhere from five to 12 years. By the time this airs, Joe Biden will have more people that died yeah. in this one year than under your That's watch. Right. And right. he was supposed to fix it. That's and right. he has the vaccines. He didn't fix anything. And actually, he scared people from taking the vaccine, which is very I agree. interesting. You look at the chart. That's it right. Hap- it, boom, it happens. You know, when I was there, we, we came up with it, and everybody wanted it. When I left, people really didn't want it. And then they do the mandates, which is terrible. Shouldn't do it. Would it you ever do anything no, like that? I, I, and they shouldn't have done it either. They scared everybody. And they hurt the economy very badly. You know, the mandates are one of the reasons you can't get anybody to work for you. The mandates have been a disaster. But I would like them to take the vaccine, but they have to do it if they want right. it. And you know what? There's plenty of people that would take it. I won't ask whether or not you've had it, but I, I had COVID. I had COVID quite badly. Okay. And they don't give credit for that. Right. If you have COVID, supposedly Especially it's serious, as good. Yeah. Supposedly right. it's as good. Why wouldn't you get credit for that? They don't give credit for mm-hmm. that. You need to get the vaccination. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's ridiculous. But they don't trust the Biden administration. And that's why they're not doing it. With all of that being said, if we didn't come, I believe this would have been a 1917 catastrophe, you know, where perhaps yeah. oh, yeah. 100 million people died. Right. But all over the world, we saved 10 million people, 20 million. We may have saved 100 million. It was spreading like wildfire. But we have to keep our freedoms also. And they didn't do that. You, um, I think when, when this was coming out of China, it was perfectly reasonable to shut everything down yeah. because we didn't know. They were Correct. welding people into their homes in China. We That's had right. no idea they, and they weren't being open. And by us. the way, they welded them in and they never opened them. Right. That was the end of them. Fauci, I wanted to give, I wanted to give everybody the benefit of the doubt in those early yeah, days. I understand. We have done a ton of research. I did one of the biggest chalkboards I think I've ever done. Right. Um, they were using federal government money to do... Um, uh, Wuhan. Yeah, in Wuhan. I stopped it. Right. I was the one that stopped well, it. Well, you did, but I don't think Fauci uh, cared about that. Fauci's yeah. now claiming he's science. Did you ever, did you ever, would he still be working for you today? No, not now, but, but he's a great promoter. He's not a great doctor, but he's a great promoter. <laughs> But you have to understand, everything he wanted, I didn't do. As an example, he wanted to keep it open to China. He ultimately was wrong about that and admitted it and admitted that I saved tens of thousands of lives. He wanted to keep it open. I saw what was happening in Italy and France Mm -hmm. and Spain, Mm -hmm. and I closed it to Europe very early. You know, in China, it was January I closed it, and in Europe, it was shortly thereafter. We saved thousands and thousands of lives. He wanted to do that. And then his big one of them all is the masks are useless. They don't mean anything. And then all of a sudden, he wants you to wear 10 masks. You know, wear as many as you can. Put <laughs> right. them all over, cover your right. ears, do everything. So I didn't really do much of what he said. And he wasn't a big factor for me, in a sense, because of that. I think he thinks the presidency works for him now. Well, he's totally controlling Biden. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm saying... Uh, he, they are doing what he wants to do now. But I didn't do that. Remember, his big thing was keep it open to China. I said, wait a minute, you have people. Now, since then, we've learned so much about this disease. Right. And you know, when they locked down a city like New York, it was so bad, and yet it was totally locked down. It was locked down, and they were in worse shape than Texas and Florida mm-hmm. and South Dakota and so many other places. They were doing worse. People that had no contact with other people were catching COVID, or the China virus, as I call it, because it's a much more accurate term. And you think of it, Len, they have no access to anything, and they were catching it. How did it happen? Who knows? But these lockdowns didn't work, and they were destroying the kids. They were destroying... Children have been set back so badly, not having gone to schools so badly. I I have a teenage son, and I've talked about this rarely, but because of the lockdown, being at school, in my family, we had a suicide attempt. He attempted suicide. Wow. I, you know I didn't yeah. know that? And I I've only talked about it once. 
the mental health of our kids yeah. is on the edge and no one was will, no one's willing to talk about that consequence. It's incredible. And by the way, children you talk about, but people look at the suicide rates, look I at know. the depression, look at all of the other things. People have been destroyed with these lockdowns. It, it's so horrible the way they've handled it. And we understand the disease now. We understand it. We understood it quite a while ago. You look at Cuomo where he was doing the grandstanding all over the place. Yeah. He was a disaster. You know, I sent a hospital ship to New York. And I said, I built a hospital, 2,800 beds in the Javits Center, Convention mm -hmm. Center, and they didn't use it. They sent the people that were infected back into the nursing, nursing homes. homes. I said, why aren't you using these things? The captain, an admiral, called. He said, they're not using the ship. And we actually had a design for COVID, which is, you know, different mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of ventilation and everything else. Did an incredible job. We had a two-week turnaround. It was incredible, the job they did. And we kept saying, where are the people? And yet, they're going back into nursing homes and people are dying. It was incredible. We did a great job. Some of these governors did a horrible job. I think it's critically important that you get your finances in order, that we save as much money as we possibly can. And that's where American financing comes in. If you want to shore up your financing, all you have to do is call American financing. They could be helping you save a couple of hundred bucks to a thousand dollars every single month on your mortgage. Might mean a refi. It might mean that you do a new consolidation loan. Those high interest credit cards are going to become even higher interest credit cards. The Fed has already said that they are going to raise the rates. It should happen any time, could happen by spring. No upfront or hidden fees. They could save you a lot of money. Please just call Home Title Lock. You could close in as little as 10 days. Go to, I'm sorry, not Home Title Lock, American Financing. Go to AmericanFinancing.net. That's AmericanFinancing.net, 800-906-2440. It's AmericanFinancing.net. Let me pivot to um, schools. What is fascinating to me, before President Biden even walked into the Oval Office, he had just taken the oath and his staff um, began executing an executive order. Yeah. The f one of the first one, if not the first one, was to pull the 1776 commission report. Which I set up. Which you set up. It was completely reasonable. I've read it. It is accurate history. And if you look at that, I thought at the time, why would that be your first priority? We now know. And we, we have school boards uh, right. running things into Marxist territory, pitting our kids against each other, and the FBI investigating parents. A, is it time to get rid of the Department of Education and give the schools back to the states and to the parents? So I wanted to do that. We would have done that, or we would have done a very big form of it. You have people in Washington, D.C. that don't even care about the kids. They're bureaucrats. They're working in right. Washington. And they're telling people in Iowa, and they're telling people in Idaho, and in other places, faraway places, where every place is different. They're telling them exactly what they're going to study. You don't need that. There should be a little coordination, like sure. you have to learn English. <laughs> yeah. You have to have some basic math. But what they were doing was terrible. And then what happened is it started getting into the whole cancel culture thing and all of the different things that you've been reading about, which is totally true. What they were doing, it's totally They're true. You know, they tried, to, they tried to say yeah. with the Yunkin race, which was very mm -hmm. good, which we helped them a lot. Mm -hmm. It would have been a big, I'll tell you what, that would have been a terrible result yes. if we yes. didn't. But that was a good race. And people really saw what was happening with the schools. So. I think it's a great thing to get, get the heck out of Washington. You know, some of these states do a great, a terrific job. They can't move because of the federal government. They can't do what they want to do. And look at where we stand internationally. We spend three times more for education per student than any other country in the world. 
and we're in 38th place. It's terrible. So you give it back to the states, where the states, and some of these states will do a fantastic job. Not all of them. Mm -hmm. You have some mm -hmm. that are badly run themselves. They're not going to mm -hmm. do so well. But you'll have states that are doing a phenomenal job. They'll be, they'll be doing a job like Norway, like Sweden. I hate to say this, like China. You know, China has great education. They do a fantastic job. They're rated number three. And, and for a small fraction of the money that we right. spend per student, because that's right. the only way you can judge it. Right. We spend three times more than any other country. Take the second country, we spend three times more. And some of these kids come out of school, they can't read or write. It's really bad. So uh, the problem here is, and you exposed this, and even I was uncomfortable when you said the press is the enemy of the people. You were right. Um, I knew the deep state was a thing, this bureaucracy that just doesn't answer to anybody. Um, but I didn't realize how bad it was until you started to expose it. I just made but a you list. You exposed it also. I remember you long before I got this involved. I used to get great press, remember, before oh, I, I ran know. for politics. I guess that's how loved. I got elected. Yeah. I got. I was the, the boy wonder, I was getting great press. I mean, historically, I yeah, would yeah, get yeah, pretty yeah. good press. Long before that, you were hitting the press pretty hard. They were also hitting you pretty hard, yeah. and you realized it was unfair. Right. No, I said they're the enemy of the people. I came up with the fake news. I know. They're the, one of the best of all names. They're fake news. But now I realize it's not strong enough. They're really the corrupt news. They're very corrupt. As I look at the deep state, Let's just pretend you're going to you're going to run again, okay. um, and you're president. Two terms, you'll have four years. Right. As I look at it, you have to pretty much clean house right. at Justice, the FBI, CIA, NSC, NIH, the State Department, Treasury, HHS, Department of Edge, Education, and the Department of e uh, Energy. Their roots are deep in those. Deep. Many, many years. Can you, in four years, I know you're good at this, you've yeah. had a show, you're fired. No, no, no. Can you fire and replace all of those things in four years? You pretty much have to. Look, when I got elected, I was only in Washington, D.C. 17 times. They say, I mean, I think it's about that right, but they did say. Of the 17, I never stayed overnight. And many of those, those times, we're building a hotel, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful hotel, it's a great hotel, at the old post office, right, on Pennsylvania Avenue. So I was never here. I never was into the world of the Washington, D.C. All of a sudden, I'm president. And I rely on people. We had great people. We had some great people, and we had some bad choices, too. The answer is yes, we have to do that. And it can be absolutely done. But I realized, as time went by, I re I, and I got to know I went from knowing nobody to knowing just about everybody. Mm -hmm. I know incredible people. And we did. Look, we rebuilt the military. We did so many different I things know. that nobody, including the vaccines, but we did so many things that nobody thought possible. You know, one right to try, where the FDA is very slow with drugs, we got to cut in half. But still, if somebody's dying terminally ill, Let and we try. have something that's great, we now are able to give it to them because, right. and it's working miracles. What's right. happening to people, it's incredible, saving lives. But we did so many things. But now I know what's happening. I know so many people that are so great that are longing to come in with the same attitude that you have of changing it. Now, for 30 years, whether it's Bush mm -hmm. and some of the Republicans are, honestly, some mm -hmm. of these rhino Republicans are worse than Mitch McConnell. They're worse. Mitch McConnell is a disaster. He's a total disaster. He gave up the debt ceiling for nothing. He just gave them the debt ceiling. For, he is a total disaster, Mitch. But when you take a look, the Republicans, we've had Bush, Clinton, Obama, and at that time, many, many years of of mm -hmm. people being put into place. Mm -hmm. They've been there for 30 years, 35 years. Has to be cleaned out. Has to be cleaned out. I've been uh, <clears throat> diagnosed with COVID, uh, so I'm in quarantine in my house. I also started a diet about three or four days ago, and I'm determined not to break it this time. 
the thing that has been helping me here is Built Bars. Built Bars, they are rich with flavor, covered in real chocolate, and yet amazingly low in calories, sugar, and net carbs and fat. It's a protein bar, but it tastes like a candy bar. And quite honestly, right now, I don't feel like eating anything. My wife has been, have a Built Bar, have a Built Bar, have something good for you. Um, and it's a delight to eat them. Try them right now. They've got tons of different flavors. Get the mixed bag box um, and you'll be able to try out and find your favorite flavors. It's built.com. Use the promo code BEC15. Get 15% off your order right now. Use the promo code BEC15 for 15% off at built.com. That's built.com. You did more with just your sheer force of you than any president I, I know of. You can't go in and do another four years if you don't, if you have the same kind of GOP support that you had last time. Right. How do we get the GOP? What should the GOP and the people who vote that way, what would, should we be demanding right now? And I had great GOP support. Let me tell you, we have some great people. As you know, Jim Jordan and so many, oh, Jim yeah. Banks, we have, we have a lot of great people. Yeah. Great people. Remember this, on the impeachment hoax, number one, in Congress, I got 196 votes to nothing. Nobody's ever heard of that, especially with the Republican Party. And with the Senate, other than Romney, who I lost a half a vote, I got 100% of the vote. We have some great support. We have great people. But we have to let them go to town. We have to let them go to town. What is that? Mean? I don't think we have any, we have to let the good ones do what they're doing. And I will say, and I've said it a lot, when I came in to this job, I had two jobs, run the country and survive. Because <laughs> I was investigated viciously from the day I came down the escalator with a very popular future first lady. Mm. But I came down the escalator in Trump Tower and I was under investigation from that day. And I had to run the country and I had to survive. And despite the fact that I had to survive and did survive, we did more than any president, virtually any president, when you look at all of the things we could go through them so lengthy, including the rebuilding. And can you imagine? We rebuild our military, and then they give $85 billion worth of that equipment to the Taliban. And they take the generals. The generals move our military out before they take our citizens I've, out. I've always trusted our military. My son wanted to go into the military. It's been hurt very badly. I don't know if I can tell my son to go in the military. I, don't tr I trust the military. I do not trust the command now. I call them the television generals. But remember this, I took over 100% of the caliphate, if you look at it, ISIS, the caliphate. I, I took I'm over. I'm the caliphate king. Okay. I watched. And I took I down al-Baghdadi. You yeah. know who al-Baghdadi yep. was? And that was from day one. I said, you, the military is great. We have great generals, but not these television guys like Millie. We have great generals, and I know a lot of them. And by the way, they were so supportive of me. Do you ever see the list of the generals and admirals mm -hmm. in support of mm -hmm. President Trump? But we took out 100% of the ISIS caliphate. Think of that in Syria, in Iraq, and got al-Baghdadi, and Soleimani, and so many others. And you know, the, the, the military is great, but the guys on television are terrible. Secretary of Defense, you take a look at what's happening over there. They made so many bad decisions. Think of this, and, and don't believe that I, don't believe that China, Russia, Kim Jong-un, Iran wasn't watching. When we surrendered in Afghanistan, it was like we surrendered to take the military out first and to leave American hostages, it's probably thousands of them, and to take hundreds of thousands of people out of Afghanistan. We had no idea who they were. There are many terrorists in that group. Only 3% of them, it now turns out, were qualified to leave. But to do that and to, to lose soldiers, we lost 13, but we badly, badly wounded, meaning no arms, no legs, 28 soldiers, and 250 people overall were killed. This should have never happened. We had an understanding, I had, with Abdul. He was the head, and he still is the head of the Taliban. In 18 months, not one American soldier was killed. 
And I wanted to get out more than anybody. You know that. I got it down to 2,500 yeah. soldiers. We were going to take everything out. All the equipment was starting. And I said, I don't want to leave a nail, a screw, a bolt, I a know. tank, a plane. Everything comes out. Even the tents that we used as the hangers, everything. They said, sir, it's cheaper to leave it. I said, we're taking everything. And we were going to keep Bagram. Very important. Because Bagram bombed the other five places. And I said, bomb them from air. Use it as practice. But we're keeping Bagram because it's right next to China, one hour away from where they make nuclear weapons. And to watch these people give up everything. And now China is occupying Bagram. I will, I will tell you, Mr. President, and I've never said this to anybody. Nobody knows this. Um, you know, we went in and we rescued a lot of people yes, in Afghanistan. That's right. Um, the State Department was so horrible. Um, but one of the planes that they said, we have to, they have to fill, we had to fly out before we, we could get any of our other people out. Some of our own soldiers. My first plane we um, flew out after the collapse of the airport right. was filled with our own soldiers. And I, I have to tell you, we made the deal because that was the only deal that would get the other people out. But when the United States of America leaves some of our own special forces back and needs a private uh, charity to fly them out, it's reprehensible. Reprehensible. Not even believable. By the way, not even believable. And I'm going to tell you, there's a fly on your hair. Yeah. Thank you. And you know what? The last time there was a fly in somebody's hair, it didn't, didn't work out so well. I know. I, know, I, I know. just saw a fly. In. Did you see that? You'll see it. And I said, you know what? Get that fly off your hair. Thank you. Before we leave, I know you're on a tight schedule. I think Melania was one of the best first ladies. Jackie O quality. Right. Um, she restored the White House garden. She didn't change it. She restored it to Jackie O and got slaughtered so for it. So beautiful, the job. So beautiful. The book that you guys are putting out, the coffee table right. book, A, I hope it has focused somewhat on her work that she did, yes. uh, and B is, did you do a coffee table picture book because there's another uh, four years that you're going to have to write if, to put it into a real biography of your presidential years? So we did a book which has been selling like hotcakes, yeah. 150,000 in the first two weeks. And, and normally a book like that won't sell to the same extent, you know, because they're waiting for yeah, the yeah. other book where I talk right. about a lot of stories. Yeah. But I write about certain photos. And I did it really for a different reason. It's so sad, our country right now. I don't think we've ever been lower. And despite all of the witch hunts and the phony Russia, 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 impeachments, it was a beautiful time. We had the greatest economy in history. We then had the China virus come in, and then I rebuilt the economy. I really rebuilt it twice. The second time, harder than the first. But we had the greatest economy, the greatest everything. It was a glamour period. It was a beautiful period. Mm -hmm. And now I see what's happening with energy, with inflation, with the military, with it's these awful. clowns. Uh, and I said, you know what, let's put out a book talking about how beautiful it was because we're going to make it that way again. And it's people like you that really, you have done such an incredible job. You give people hope. It's so important because there I know. are not a lot of people that understand that word hope. But you give people hope and you have for a long time. And Thank I really commend you on it. Thank you, Mr. President. I hope we get a chance to talk again. And I sincerely hope that you are running again oh, thank you very in much, four Tom. years. Thank you, sir. Thank you. On Sunday, the New York Times editorial board ran a story declaring, quote, January 6th is not in the past, it's every day. That pretty much summarizes the left's whole philosophy of January 6th. The Times editorial goes on to rant about how Republican lawmakers at the state level are passing laws that are a continuation of the Capitol riot, quote, in a bloodless and legalized form. That is so dumb, I don't even know where to begin on that. The state laws will be subjected to all of the normal legal scrutiny and challenges, and they're being passed by elected representatives under constitutional rules. This is how this process is supposed to work. But you see, the left doesn't like the process. 
They've always hated it. And that's why Chuck Schumer is going to force us a vote in the Senate this month on abolishing the filibuster. That's why President Biden issued 77 executive orders in his first year in office. That's the most of any president in a single year since Jimmy Carter in 1978. Democrats don't like the constitutional process because it's difficult. It means they can't achieve the level of power and control that they want because it includes you, the people. The left is wrong about January 6th. It's not every day. It's a backward looking strategy and failing with regular Americans. The left and the media are so disengaged from what the average American cares about right now, it's startling. Starting with midterm elections this November and continuing into the next presidential election, the candidate who will win will be the one that earns credibility with regular Americans by actually listening to them and then doing what they said. Democrats used to understand this, but now they're the party of grievances, socialism, control, and payback. If Donald Trump decides to run again in 2024, which I think it seemed pretty clear to me that he was. He would win if he uses the same kind of uh, tactics that he did in 2016. He won in 2016 because he listened to the half of America plus that the left dismisses every time. They are losing their base. Whoever challenges Joe Biden is going to, is going to have to be open, honest and run a positive campaign, one that looks over the horizon, one that will fill people with the feeling, yeah, this can be fixed and I'll do it. Positive campaign because America is clearly headed in a disastrous direction under the current leadership and the first opportunity to correct course, believe it or not, is now just 10 months away.